A lot of what has happened to us as sexual abuse, unwanted experiences is normal, but we don't know that it's normal because we haven't talked about it, haven't learned about it. Mm. And so that's a huge piece of what I'm doing with people in the in the room doing therapy is normalizing their experience. Mm. And they're like, oh my God, I'm not the only one. Like, no, you're far from the only one. Hello, friend, and welcome to the Sex Upgraded Podcast, a podcast for men all about sex, where we'll combine real, authentic, and down-to-earth conversations about sex, life, and relationships with some pretty wild personal stories and practical how-to episodes as well with guest experts from around the world to help you have the most amazing sex life you can possibly have. My name is Taylor and I'll be your host on this journey and it's my goal with each episode to give you practical, actionable things you can start doing today to improve your sex life and your entire life because a thriving sex life will help you thrive in all areas of your life. So let's begin today's episode by starting with a deep breath in through the nose into the belly together. Exhaling with an audible sigh. And let's get into today's episode. Hello, (laughs) and welcome to the show. I'm really excited to be here with you. This is Papillon. We are in my office in Asheville, downtown right now, and the topic for today is sexual trauma. Yay! (laughs) Papillon is a licensed therapist who specializes in sexual trauma. They use they, them pronouns, and I'd love, yeah, for you to introduce yourself. What is it that you do? Uh, what do you specialize in? And why did you show up here today for this conversation? Sure. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Um, feel really honored. And yeah, sexual trauma is incredibly prevalent. It's something that we as a society are just starting to talk about, you know, with the Me Too movement popping off a few years ago. Um I specifically got my start working with a local nonprofit called Our Voice here in Asheville, which offers free counseling for survivors, whether it was as a child or recently. Um, They also offer free counseling for what are called secondary survivors, partners, Mm -hmm. families, loved ones who are struggling with how to deal with and accept and support what's happened to a loved one. Um, so great resource. And yeah, I got my start with them as a professional therapist straight out of grad school. I interned with them and then they hired me because we loved each other so much. And I worked with them for five years and uh, wow. received a lot of training, um, a lot of guidance, a lot of mentorship. And um, yeah, I just feel like it's really important work. And, you know, I love all the work that you're doing around talking about the many facets of sex and sexuality. And I think talking about sexual trauma is a very important one. And I'm glad that you agree. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super important topic. And Papillon also started a podcast a number of years ago mm-hmm. uh, called the I, Am I Broken podcast. And it's survivor stories, people mm-hmm. who've actually experienced sexual assault t- sharing their stories. And that sounds like a fascinating and rich and raw, uh, raw listen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, There'll be a link to that in the show notes as well. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. It is, it is uncensored. It also, as much as it focuses on what happened to them, it focuses on how they healed. And then I also share a lot of thoughts on nervous system regulation and coping skills and, um, normalizing what has happened with facts and statistics. Mm. And so it's not as gruesome as you might think from the outset. Nice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Well, I say we start things off with a question then the topic is sexual trauma. Let's define trauma. What is trauma? That's a great question. (laughs) How would you, how would you define trauma? Yeah. Um, so I guess I would define it as an aversive experience that deeply painfully impacts our nervous system physiologically Mm. stays with us over time and impacts 
our relationship with ourselves, with other people, and or with the world at large. Mm. Stays with us. Mm -hmm. So it's different from, oh, I had a shitty day. Or different from, oh, I stubbed my toe, or maybe different from, I got in an argument with my person and I feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. it something that lasts. Yeah, lasts and maybe doesn't receive the reconnection, the repair that it needs in order to pass through or to be integrated. Mm. Like that's that's as much a trauma for my clients. Like they may have experienced sexual trauma from something... Um, a singular incident to something like horrific and long-term, but no one has ever come to therapy and said, I had this um, unwanted or abusive sexual experience. And then I told my parents and they believed me and they got me therapy yeah. or they confronted the person and ejected that person from our lives. So there's a secondary trauma around carrying it ourselves or, just not having the support necessary to heal and integrate a difficult experience. Interesting. So something happens. It's too much in the moment for the person to handle and too much for their potential community to handle in that moment. And therefore it doesn't get resolved. And then it sounds like it, it just anchors itself in the body somewhere and shows up later in a myriad of ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely from physiological difficulties, panic attacks, um, difficulty trusting, um, compulsive behavior, all different kinds of ways it can show up. So is there a difference or is there a spectrum of trauma? Would you say like we're just maybe just talked about some large traumas, maybe sexual assault, rape, that sort of thing. Are there micro traumas or smaller traumas, like different things people can experience that maybe weren't this massive thing where they look back on their life and they say, oh, this really intense thing happened, but there's maybe a smaller version that can somehow still live in the body in a similar way? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a couple of things come to mind. One is that it's worth looking up something called the rape culture pyramid, hmm. which ranges from stuff like boys will be boys, locker room talk, what was she wearing, you know, just different ways that we, um, unfortunately, our society talks about um, sexual events um, all the way up to and including actual sexual assault. Yeah. Um, so that's worth looking up, the rape culture pyramid. Um and I mean, there are all kinds of things that happen that people don't even necessarily code as sexual abuse or sexual assault. Um, covert condom removal mm -hmm. is one example. Um, I had a client who was devastated, traumatized by this happening to him um, from someone that he cared about and trusted. You know, um, what I've developed as terminology is, um, so formally uh, what's, what's used as an unwanted or abusive sexual experience, which really broadens the scope. You know, it can be like, oh, that kind of weird thing that happened that mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily overtly abuse, but still stuck with me and makes me feel sick to my stomach. Um, I've started to use the term sexualized violation. There's some way in which a boundary is crossed. Mm. There's something about it that's sexual or sexualized intimate in that way. Um, so that's, that's a term I've kind of developed over time on the podcast. Yeah. Interesting. I'd like to share a couple personal anecdotes if you're open to that and ask sure. a couple questions about them and then, okay. and then go into this other piece that is around how does this show up in men's experiences in men's bodies? You know, because a lot of guys think, oh, the trauma, this is something that happens to women. You know, mm -hmm. this is something that we're we're fine. Like we don't have these problems. Like, right. you know, we need to be strong, et cetera, et cetera. So there's two examples that I can think of in my past that happened in a sexual experience. And one of those is I was having sex with my girlfriend when I was in my early 20s and I ejaculated much quicker than I wanted to. And she got really angry. And mm. she like, she's like, that's it. 
rah, you know, and had this whole like kind of response. And in my body, it was a terrifying experience, also an experience full of shame and all this stuff that impacted how we had sex for the rest of our relationship and how I had sex with people going forward for a little while. Never really thought in the moment that that could have been somehow traumatic in some way, but do you think that could, that kind of experience could fall under the spectrum of this? Well, we're sitting here talking about it, you know, however many years later, decades later, like it has stuck with you Mm. and you're bringing it up. It's in a sexual content or in a sexual um, context. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Like bluntly, what I call that sexual abuse or sexual assault, probably not. Yeah. Um, Was it a violation of your boundaries, of your sense of self, of your identity? Probably. Was it in a sexual context? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think the more inclusive we can be without being absolutely ridiculous, you know, then the more people are going to be able to talk about this and uh, hopefully heal and integrate some painful experiences. Yeah. I wonder about the usefulness of of naming that as trauma versus just naming that as a hard experience and mm-hmm. possibly does naming something like that as trauma open up more doors for healing mm-hmm. potentially. Mm-hmm. Something I'm curious about. Yeah. I mean, I would like to think so. You know, calling calling it something with a term this was trauma helps at times often to put it in a box that then orients us to what might need to happen. You know, if it's an event that emotionally impacted you deeply, affected that relationship, affected your sexual relationships going forward in the future, yeah. I would call that traumatic. It stuck with you. It stayed inside of you. And it, I assume has taken you some time to heal and integrate and work with. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Cool. There's so just another facet that might be helpful. Um, often folks will refer to like capital T trauma and little t trauma. Hmm. You know, big T trauma is like an earthquake, you know, um, or some type of violent sexual assault. Little t trauma is stuff that just kind of happens in a relationship or builds along the way. Um, you know, being catcalled over and over again on the street, for example. Yeah. Um, as just as traumatic, it's not comparing the two, um, but trying to um, not justify, trying to give credence to both. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. There's there's another brief story that I want to share too, because I, I hear from people who listen to this podcast who say, wow, hearing stories is super helpful. Of things Absolutely. that have actually happened. I can, I can relate with that, you know, versus the hypothetical, here's how you accomplish X, Y, and Z five steps to fix your trauma forever. Yeah. You know, the more you buy, the more you say, right. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> which maybe we can get into some of that stuff in a little sure. bit. I'd love to talk about healing and working with, um, but to give another example of an experience that stayed with me and lived in my body because people don't talk as much about these, maybe the smaller T traumas. There was one time when I was having sex with this woman I was in relationship with, and we were very clear. We had we had all the conversations up front about not wanting to have any risk of pregnancy or minimal risk of pregnancy as possible, using condoms, not even ejaculating inside the condom in the, with this person, okay. just being like extra. I mean, that was a huge fear of mine, right? And so mm-hmm. long story short, we were in the sexual experience and I did ejaculate intentionally and it was on her chest where she mm-hmm. wanted me to. Mm-hmm. And in the heat of the moment, she rubbed it all over her body and down into her vagina, uh-huh. like in the ah! moment. And internally, it was a total freak out freeze experience. It's uh-huh. like, holy fucking shit, Do- Ah, yeah. Can I get mad? I don't know if it's okay to get mad. I don't know. It was the total like freeze thing, and mm-hmm. I shut down. And then, eventually, later that evening, like we talked about it, and I said, "I really think we need to go get a plan B." Like this is mm-hmm. very uncomfortable for me. I didn't ask you to do that. And then the whole argument ensued. Like, well, this is my body. I can do what I want with my body. Is what they said. Mm. I was like, but I didn't ask you to put this inside yourself. Yeah. It gave me a complex, actually. For a complex is a strong word. I guess it, yeah, it gave me some really embodied fear response of ejaculating with women. Yeah. 
Cause I couldn't control what they did with it afterwards. Yeah. You know, it was like a deeply scary experience for me. So after that ended shortly after that experience, like it was a while before I was sexual with anybody else again, yeah. just to kind of like regain some fear. So I would put that potentially under little T trauma because it definitely Absolutely. stuck with me. Yeah. It impacted you. It hit you right in a fear point. Totally. You know, there's this question around like, wait a minute, my ejaculate is that's my body. Like that's my, my body's ejaculate, but wait, how are you doing whatever you want with it? I thought we agreed, you know, that there was a boundary where my ejaculate wouldn't go inside of you yeah. in a way that could create pregnancy. You know, there's like, and a little bit different from the first story where this person wasn't, um, acting maliciously trying to hurt your feelings, wasn't angry at you. She was lost in sexual ecstasy. Totally. You know, awesome. Yeah. And there, there were some boundaries crossed there. And it sounds like, I'm sorry to hear that y'all weren't able to have a collaborative conversation around that, that it turned into conflict. Eventually we did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it turned into conflict initially and then eventually it turned into collaboration. And then we realized we probably shouldn't keep being together. Okay. You know, I think... Ultimately, it was a useful learning experience and a good story to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, wow. <laughs> it's funny. That, well, funny is the wrong word, but it really does stick with me. Both of those stories that I just told, like even when I tell them now, like many, many, many years later, I can still picture the experience like vividly in my imagination. Like mm -hmm. I can see the whole frame and almost the smell of the situation and everything. Mm -hmm. It's like anchored in there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's trauma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I and mean, not to the point now where it has impacted me. Like I'm, I'm in a great relationship. Like I'm having great sex and all that stuff, uh, Good. But, but still in the body, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which brings up a question. Does it ever go away or do you just learn to work with it, live with it, et cetera? So in my experience, you know, I mean, as a survivor of sexual trauma myself and as a professional therapist in this area for going on eight plus years, um, it doesn't go away. Mm. You know, we can continue to work with it, heal the different layers of it, reach plateaus. Um, I hardly think about mine, you know, um, especially now that I've taken a break from doing the podcast, it doesn't yeah. come up as often, you yeah. know, um, but it's always there, you know, it's a part of us. It's our, some of our experiences in life, they have shaped us to varying degrees. Um, when I talk with clients about it, you know, people have to be in the right frame of mind to hear this and not feel a sense of doom. Mm. Um, but I just talk about scars, you know, like we don't always have the wound, but we're always going to have the scar and scars can be, um, cool. I love scars. I think they're beautiful. Yeah. You know, um, they can be a marker of something that we survived and like worked through and healed from. Yeah. That's beautiful. I like that. And then the question comes up for me, how, how does somebody know? So one of the questions I got asked is how do I know if I have trauma, you know, and if I'm having, I know it's kind of potentially a vague question, but if I'm having these relational difficulties, how do I know, know if it's a traumatic experience that's caused this or if it's just my personality or something else psychologically that I need to work on? And then is that even worth differentiating? It's a great question. I definitely discourage people from trauma hunting mm. or like hunting for sexual abuse memories that might be repressed or something. But I guess what comes to mind is something I ask clients when they're wrestling with, you know, is this circumstantial? Is this due to my trauma? How old and familiar is this feeling? Mm. And then we can work with that and often trace it back to its origin or its era. Trauma hunting. Discouraged trauma hunting. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I see, I have seen in the online space over the past few years, there's a huge explosion in people talking about trauma and people saying, this is like, I'm trauma informed or like, what does that even mean? You know, how do you become yeah. trauma informed and like trauma this and trauma that? And it's, I think it's 
on one hand, as a non-therapist, like it seems really useful for me that people are actually having these conversations. It's great and it's beautiful. And also I've wondered a couple of times, has it just become the cool new fad and are people potentially doing the trauma hunting sort of a thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's true of anything, Yeah, you know, um, anything that rises into social consciousness, it's great that it is there and gets people talking about it. And then it becomes a buzzword. It becomes monetized. You know, it's just, it's just what happens. So, yeah. but I think the benefits outweigh um, some of the negative outcomes. Got it. Mm -hmm. So do you work with a particular population of people or is it all bodies, all genders? Yeah, all bodies, all genders. Um, I was originally hired by Our Voice to reinvigorate their male survivors program. And so that's mm -hmm. where I started um, working with men individually, running groups, which was super cool. Um, ended up developing like a retreat for mm -hmm. survivors who had been through individual and group sessions to like go do some advanced healing. Um, in the male survivor groups, one of our rules was or agreements, tried to frame them as agreements that everybody was agreeing to as part of the structure, um, that we wouldn't talk about what happened to us in order to keep the space safer. Mm. Um, somebody might say like, it was my aunt or I was eight or something like that, <clears throat> but that's as far as we got. Um, then in the, the weekend retreat, guys would actually have an opportunity to tell their story while the other guys listened. We would have, um, you know, coping skills set up. Everybody would have the opportunity if they needed to, to put the brakes on and slow things down. And that's actually what birthed the podcast mm. was one guy was sharing his story. And when he was finished, another guy turned to him and said, wow, that was so amazing and so well told. It was just like listening to a podcast. And mm. I went, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and then that birthed the podcast. Yeah. Um, so it started with male survivors and then, but I was working with survivors of any gender, um, tried to be very conscious that, you know, being pretty butch and hairy myself, there are some folks who might feel intimidated um, having a therapist with my characteristics. So um, I, I have worked with a fair amount of cis women um, who felt comfortable enough, which is great. Um and then some folks in the trans community reached out to our voice and reached out to me and uh, asked us to start a group for trans and non-binary non survivors. And so um, I got some extra training just to make sure um, I was informed and wasn't going to make some dumb mistakes that really hurt anybody. Um, and we started um, some groups for folks from, from these communities and what was so interesting is like two or three groups in, I was like, holy fuck, I belong here. Mm. Like there's a way in which I just resonate with so much that these folks are bringing. Um, and so of course, like I took a year or so to just really think about it, parse it out. Cause I didn't want to be like, hi, I'm white socialized male. I belong in your marginalized community. Yeah. You know, um, I wanted to be really careful about that, but that's actually what inspired me to understand that, um, I am non-binary, uh, and I am genderqueer in a lot of ways. I've never felt like I fit, um, prescribed gender roles. Um, and yeah, so that, that group was amazing too. Um, and I feel really like honored to originally have been asked and entrusted with that responsibility. Mm. So that's my long answer to anybody, any gender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Seeing as the, the majority of people who are listening to this podcast are, are men, mm -hmm. uh, cis men, generally speaking, have you seen ways that trauma shows up in that particular population that might be different from other people or does it show up pretty similarly across all people? I would say there are things that are unique to how it impacts cis men. Um, for one, um, cis men generally tend to be a lot more hesitant to talk about it. Mm. Um, men wait an average of 25 years before they tell one person. And that person is usually their spouse. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is uh, 
real facts, real statistics. Yeah. Um, I can't cite them in the moment, um, but if you look them up, if listeners want to look them up, they're available. Um, so that's one piece is like a reticence to talk about it. Yeah. Um, another is, you know, encountering some of that stuff around maleness and masculinity in our society, you know, um, men are supposed to be tough. They're not supposed to be victims. Um, a lot of guys wrestle with, and I hear women wrestle with this some too, but more guys, but like, is the abuse responsible for my sexuality? Mm. Like, did this make me gay? Am I gay because this happened? Um, the short answer being like, no, we're wired how we're wired and sexual abuse does not, um, radically change or create our sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? That's everything off the top of my head. There's more, I'm sure. Yeah. I've heard some people say there's, there's a fear that if they were abused, that it means they're more likely to abuse people. Totally. I, but I've heard that that's, that's a huge fear and it's not true. I've heard that that's not true. Okay. It's not true at all. Yeah. No, statistically. It's not true at all. Yeah. No. Um, another soapbox that I often get on, like um, a lot of men are survivors of sexual abuse from a female perpetrator. Hmm. And that's even harder for them to recognize that it was an unwanted or abusive sexual experience. And then that it was traumatic, you know, that there was something wrong with it. Um, there's this great study that came out, um, less than 10 years ago on the prevalence of female perpetration by Semple and Myers, I think, mm -hmm. no, Semple and Flores. And they took a lot of government data from the CDC and from the, uh, Bureau of Justice. And they were inspired to look at this data because they looked at, um, just some initial data around non-consensual sexual experiences. And they saw that men and women reported about the same amount or frequency of unwanted coercive sexual experiences. Hmm. And men reported just as many female perpetrators as women um, male perpetrators. And so from that, they started to investigate all this different data and female perpetration is far more prevalent than you would imagine. I'll name the most... Um, shocking to me statistic. Um, I believe it was a Bureau of Justice study of um, incarcerated juveniles. Mm. So they took incarcerated juveniles and everyone who reported some form of uh, sexual abuse or sexual assault. And 68% of those reported assaults were a female perpetrator, either a guard at the prison or an inmate. Wow. So more than male. Um, that one's probably the biggest outlier, but there's so much good information in this study about mm -hmm. the prevalence of female perpetration. So I feel like it's, it's really important to know that too, that yes, anyone can perpetrate sexual violence on someone else. Mm. And if you're a guy that this has, or maybe, maybe has happened to you and you're not even sure, like I imagine the, the fear or the thought of bringing that up could be be even more massive because of, uh, well, any number of reasons, you mm -hmm. know, like, oh, you mean a woman abused you? Oh, a woman abused me? Like, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. Like, it's always the man, you know, like there's a lot of stories around that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some of the language in this study and, and other correlated ones is made to penetrate. That's something that happens. You know, mm. guys can um, suffer the misbelief that like, if I had an erection, if I was aroused or if I ejaculated, that means that I wanted it. And that's actually not true. Mm. You know, um, it means that we have a physiological nervous system that responds to sexual activity. Yeah, That's all it means. It has nothing to do with consent. It has nothing to do with will or enjoyment at all. Mm. That's rich. Mm -hmm. Let's all take a breath to that. Hmm. Yeah. I've heard stories of women share that they experienced sexual pleasure in their assault or rape experience. And it was really confusing and really fucked with them, you know, and they thought like, am I wrong? Or like, am I bad? Am I somehow 
the cause of this because I wanted it, but didn't. And, and I really like how you just explained that. You know, mm -hmm. We have a nervous system that's designed to respond to sexual stimuli and mm -hmm. it works. It does. You know? yeah. It's kept our species alive mm -hmm. <laughs> for better or worse. Yeah. 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 No, it is a total mind fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, I've worked with women who wrestle with that as well. And then on top of that, you know, like we might have completely natural fantasies, you know, around domination um, coercion or force, yeah. you know, that is healthy, is normal, is okay to have, but has nothing to do with when we actually do not want the experience. Hmm. So let's, let's pivot a little bit here. Great. Um, let's say there's somebody who has a previous sexual trauma experience in their life and now they're in relationship and now they're being sexual with their partner. And do you have any generalized advice you would give people in that scenario? Like I would imagine potentially the first advice would be if this is inhibiting your relationship in some way to seek out help with a trained therapist, I would imagine is step one. Sure. Uh, then, then what? Sure. So it's a good question. So there are a number of layers, um, one is it's important, I think, to be mindful of what's happening. Um, I, you know, just last night was experiencing some really intense anxiety about some stuff while I'm trying to connect with my partner. You know, we're trying to make passion, make out. Um, and I was aware the whole time I'm having intense anxiety. It's difficult for me to connect. Mm -hmm but I want to connect. So I'm not going to ignore or push this down. I'm going to continue to try to connect. But if at any point it feels like really invasive, I'm going to ask if we can stop. She'll hold me. I talk about it, et cetera. So primary, I would say is mindfulness. Um, I think you know, when I think about my own sexual history, I think about feeling like I had to just assume this performance character and stuff back feelings or stuff back fears or things like that. Um, so I guess, you know, what is happening while we're engaging mm -hmm. sexually? Are we split? Are we having two experiences at once that need to be brought together? Um, that's one question I would start with. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, it's, it's nobody's responsibility to disclose that they have sexual trauma, but it can be helpful if we know that our partner or it's a reasonable risk to take that our partner is going to hold space mm -hmm. and hear, um, hear that in a good way to talk about, um, ways to put on the brakes if necessary, um, Sometimes it can be hard to speak if we're feeling a really strong trigger. And so I've encouraged folks to have like, rather than a safe word, to have like a green light word, mm -hmm. you know, like keep going, this is awesome. And if that stops for a few minutes, then that's a sign for the partner mm -hmm. maybe to like slow down and check in. Other folks use nonverbal cues, you know, like tapping a shoulder means, hey, let's put the brakes on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those conversations, if they're, appropriate and it's a safe enough space to have those conversations, uh, those can be really helpful too. Mm. That's what comes to mind is the first few layers. Yeah. I like the green light word. I've never, I've never heard that before. Mm. I've heard a lot cool. of the safe word piece, but like the green light word when said regularly is the go forward and the lack of the green light word is actually mm -hmm. the safe word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it. Yeah. A lot of sexual trauma survivors can have what's called a freeze response. Mm -hmm where the nervous system shuts down and they're not able to speak. They're not able to verbalize, sometimes not able to move. And if we're lucky, you know, the other person is going to be aware enough that like something is happening non-verbally. Sometimes it's a subtler freeze where we just kind of dissociate a little bit. Yeah. And part of us is having sex and the other part of us is watching from the ceiling and it can be difficult to say anything from that place, you know, to actually use vocal cords mm -hmm. or to like be the person who's interrupting a sexual experience. 
You know, that's a really big responsibility. Yeah. You know, we're having sexy time and now I'm suddenly going to stop. It can be hard to do. Totally. Mm -hmm. Especially if you haven't talked about it beforehand. Yeah. I can see we're talking about it would be super, super helpful. Mm -hmm. And what about the potential role of bringing in, like intentionally working on that within the context of your sexual relationship? Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Like, so, so let me give you an example. And I'm not saying everybody should go out and do this. I'm not saying it was even a good idea when I tried this. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, it ended well. I could see how it might have ended very horribly. Um, but I was in a previous relationship, um, multiple relationships ago, I was with a woman who had experienced a very violent sexual assault in her past. We had talked about it. We like I knew all the details th that she was able to recall from the experience, at least. And we decided one day to do a kind of uh, a rape scene reenactment, you know, within our relationship. And we set up some boundaries and we set up some uh, some safe words and and went into the experience. And at first, it was really hard for me because I, you know, like yeah. <laughs> here I'm slapping this person <laughs> in a sexual context in a way that's not like the sexual spanking that I've done before. But I'm like trying to reenact this thing and mm -hmm. also experience my arousal at the same time. And what we had worked out was that whenever she would start to go into the sort of freeze or shut down experience, we would just pause and she could breathe there and cry if she needed to. Mm -hmm. And that happened multiple times throughout the experience. And she would kind of, it was as if she transported back in time almost to that experience. And mm -hmm. she was just there and we had to reorient to the present moment and then continue. And she wanted to keep going and keep going and keep going. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like slapped, like ripped the clothes off, like, force sex, all this stuff. And of course, totally consensual in this particular container, mm -hmm. a scene, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And it was a really beautiful and powerful experience. And I think ultimately she had complete control in that experience. She could have stopped it at any time. So in my mm -hmm. mind, I'm thinking without a complete understanding of trauma that you know, that I have, like she was able to control and go into this hard experience and bring awareness and bring presence to that. And somehow that was a deeply healing experience for her. Yeah, I imagine so. I'm really glad it went that way for both of you. I feel now, based on what I've learned in the years since then, I'm like, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Some yeah. Something that it did go that well. Because yeah. I could see, like, I, I, there, we were not trained to do anything like that. We just heard that it might be mm -hmm. a good idea to try. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sit here and say, everyone go out and try that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I don't know what you would say to that, yeah. but yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it was intentional. It was set up in specific ways. You had structures, you had agreements, um, and you're lucky you know, that it yeah. went well too. Yeah. Um, not to disparage what you did totally. at all, yeah. you know, like I'm really glad that it was powerful and healing for her and for you as well. I imagine like to embody that, that primal intense violence yeah. that we, you know, if we're socialized as men that we have such a weird conflicted relationship with. Yeah. So I can imagine it's healing for both of you. It was, mm -hmm. it was, would you recommend everybody go out and try that? <laughs> <Hell no. laughs> Can you say some things as to as, like the why not piece? Uh -uh. Well, because what are you going to do if something goes wrong? Yeah. You know, it's any sexual experience is a risk. And in this kind of situation, what are the risks? What are the potential worst outcomes? You know, I mean, there are people all over healing sexual trauma through kink and BDSM and stuff like that. You know, mm. awesome, great. Um, some of them more uh, informed and some of them less informed. You know, there's always the potential for hurt or harm, but I think it just takes a, a really careful risk assessment and especially what are we going to do if something goes wrong mm -hmm. yeah that was not a piece of awareness we had at the time like what are we going to do if shit goes south yeah no consideration of that 
we just thought, let's do this thing. Yeah. So I'm glad things didn't go south. I wouldn't have even known what south would have looked like, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. But mm -hmm. I could yeah. I could have imagined maybe she would just get stuck in that experience, get stuck in the freeze or, or actually go into like a physical fight response. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I could go a number of different directions, but seems smart to have a better understanding of all that beforehand. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And bless you for, for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, it's, the whole topic is very interesting to me and I'm, I'm grateful to be having this conversation right now. And I've signed up this year actually for the somatic experiencing three-year program because oh, cool. this is, this is an area that I want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that it's very important and central to a lot of what people are dealing with in the sexual realm. And Absolutely. Like, I want to increase my understanding of it mm -hmm. and my ability to help people as well. And I'm not ever going to, well, I'm not going to create a training on how to heal sexual trauma in your relationship with sex acts. <laughs> not interested in that, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating yeah, for stuff. Sure. Yeah. I too will probably never do something <laughs> like that. I mean, I do teach workshops on how to heal and work with sexual trauma mm -hmm. for therapists, for just your average person. You know, I've done it a few times at, um, Firefly, like the local uh, Earth Skills gathering, um, just real basic stuff, facts, statistics, some nervous system regulation tips, yeah. stuff like that. We don't share stories or go real deep um, or talk about who's been abused, but just, yeah, sharing some real basic healing techniques. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on the note of healing sexual trauma and possibly some basic techniques, like, is yeah. this something that somebody can do work on their own around? Do they only need to work on this with a therapist or are there things they can do by themselves if they feel like they have some sexual trauma that they want to heal in some way? Sure. Yeah. There's a lot we can do ourselves, you know, and even if we're seeing a therapist, it's just for an hour a week, Yeah. you know? And so then ideally we're going to have homework that we're going to go take and work on. Um, so for me, it's a number of areas. One is education, um, reading books, listening to podcasts, because a lot of what has happened to us as sexual abuse, unwanted experiences is normal, but we don't know that it's normal because we haven't talked about it, haven't learned about it. Mm. And so that's a huge piece of what I'm doing with people in the, in the room doing therapy is normalizing their experience. Mm. And they're like, oh my God, I'm not the only one. Like, no, you're far from the only one. Yeah. You know, one in six men report an unwanted or abusive sexual experience before the age of 18. One in six. One in six men. Wow. And that's guys who actually talk about it. Yeah. So it's probably higher, you know? So that alone is is normalizing and validating for people. Um, so education is great. Um, then a big piece of what I focus on is nervous system regulation, like we've been talking about. Um, the nervous system can have five basic responses to trauma. Fight. Um, flight, freeze, fawn, which is uh, fawning over someone. Like typically in order to psychologically survive, especially childhood sexual abuse, we make it about the perpetrator and their needs. We fawn over them. Um, we become submissive. Um, <clears throat> it's a great way to survive. Um, then the last one is fiend, the fiend response. Hmm. That's where, like, if we're really young, before we're physiologically ready to experience sexual energy, it can create a very high sort of buzzing sensation inside of us as the nervous system is overwhelmed. Mm. Um, similar if we grow up in an abusive household where at any minutes, you know, a vase could get smashed or somebody could throw somebody through a window or something like that. Shots going off. We just get used to this all the time. Mm. Then that becomes normal. And any drop out of that feels like death. And so in the fiend response, we're always looking to maintain up here, mm. you know, through addiction, through risk taking, through compulsion, things like that. So five basic responses to trauma. And there are different ways to work with these responses. They're all healthy. They're all to try and help us navigate trauma. But what happens often is our nervous system can get stuck in that response or go right to that response. And so 
I teach some basic skills. The nervous system basically is an accelerator or a brake. And the accelerator can get stuck on with a fight response or panic mm -hmm. or fiending. The brake can get stuck on with freezing, depression, stagnancy, fawning, making ourselves small. And so there are different techniques to help regulate getting our foot off the gas of the accelerator or taking our foot off the brake and having a more flexible relationship with them. Mm. That's the middle area. The last area is just working with some of the beliefs that we can come away with. Almost everyone believes that it was their fault. Yeah. That's easier to believe than that there's something wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so working with those beliefs, normalizing them, and then starting to dissect them and trying to help folks disentangle from them. A lot of, set, a lot of really critical... Self-critical talk is another part of it, trying to defuse from that and help people come into a different relationship with how they talk to themselves. Mm. I could see how that would be a very challenging belief to experience that it's my fault. Mm -hmm. You know, I created this. Something about me is inherently wrong to the point where somebody would want to assault me yeah. you know, and actually do it. Ouch. Yeah, so awful. Mm -hmm. So you help people rewire that, mm -hmm. change that. Slowly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Never try to like have an agenda that someone needs to believe differently. You know, um, I really primarily see myself as of service to their needs, their goals. I might point something out. If we have enough of a trusting relationship, I might gently challenge, you know, I'll say that a lot. Is it okay if I push back a little bit on this? Yeah. Um, and so I might gently challenge beliefs, but if someone is like really holding on to a piece, like that's their prerogative. Mm. They get to choose, which is part of the autonomy and part of the healing, right? They get to be in charge. I'm not coming in trying to make them different. You know, yeah. I'm just coming to support them and what they decide is going to be healing for them. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a jump, but it's not their fault. It's not my fault, not your fault, not anybody's fault. Who is the receiver of this thing, right? Why does it happen? Is it, is, it, is it because the world is just fucked up? Like that was the alternative option. You know, do you have a philosophy on that? Is, is it just because we live in a fucked up world and people don't know how to deal with life? This is the bigger piece, right? And this is what I help people come to terms with, because I don't only do sexual trauma therapy. Mm -hmm. Like I work with people on all different kinds of things, anxiety, depression, stuckness, you know, what a lot of people face is how do I embrace the inevitability of suffering? Mm. It's a huge question and it is inevitable, Yeah, you know, and there's a loss of innocence that people go through with sexual trauma and in general, you know, where kids are like, if they're uh, free of, you know, big T trauma or a lot of little T trauma, they're optimistic, they're hopeful. They're like, why do people hurt each other? You know, like it's a beautiful way to be, but it's also naive mm. and it's not workable to live as an adult in that way. And so a loss of innocence, I don't know if it's necessary, but I think it's inevitable as well. And so coming, helping people come to terms with that, the inevitability of suffering, I see also as part of my, my job or my perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's the, I imagine there could be multiple different flavors of that. Like the world is suffering, suffering is inevitable, right? Like you could take a, a pessimistic or a kind of down approach to that. Mm -hmm. I could see how you could also take a, like, okay, that's shitty and I'm going to try to find the joy anyway type approach. I imagine that's the approach you're taking, right? It's not like, oh, the world's a shitty place and we can just be upset about it. End of story. Maybe. I'm curious. I try not to set the agenda for where the person is going to go, yeah. but support them in the journey. Mm. It's, it's terrifying to enter the void yeah. and be in a place of, really embracing and accepting that suffering is inevitable. And this is something I'm really careful about with sexual trauma survivors, because that can be too overwhelming. It can be flooding and dysregulating. 
But if someone is ready and that's where they're headed, that is a terrifying place to be accepting the inevitability of suffering. There's nothing we can do to change that. Yeah. I feel in my journey, and sometimes if I feel it's appropriate, I give hints to someone who's struggling with it, that this isn't the end, you know, and we've done enough practicing of acceptance as a technique that they're comfortable with it. There's something beyond the void. There is something through the void. I've been in the void. I've crossed through it. I've been helped through it. And on the other side, there is something other than just this empty place of doom. But I think people need to discover what that is. Mm. You know, for me, it was empowerment and realizing that if nothing means anything, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Mm. I can create whatever I want. I can be whatever I want. Like I have that choice. And so for me, it was about power, empowerment, um, and being more of who I am as someone who never fit and is going to do whatever the fuck they think they need to do. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I want to slam the table. Like that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm curious your perspective on generational trauma and, and that term and systemic trauma, inherited trauma. Um, do you have thoughts around that? Is that a thing? Is that a buzzword? Um, I know it's kind of maybe a vague question, but I'm curious if anything lights up for you hearing those words. I think it's real. Yeah. Um, I mean, so my mom is a sexual trauma survivor mm -hmm. and didn't even remember until I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. But think about how that impacted me, right? Like if I was born identified as male, socialized as male, and she sees me in that way, how is she going to treat me? Yeah. You know, um, distant, rejecting, you know, so that impacted me and my relationship with sexuality, with femme people, you know, um, there are experiences that I've had with clients where they're working their own sexual trauma and then they experience how far back this goes. When I ask them that question, how old and familiar is this? Mm -hmm. They go past their own life. Mm. They go farther back, you know? And I really believe in the richness of what people are experiencing in these, in these healing moments. So I do believe that um, trauma gets passed down, patterns get passed down, um, you know, abuse gets passed down, all these things. Yeah. Interesting. And one more question potentially to close on. Well, we'll see if we close on this, but okay. circumcision trauma, is that a thing also? And I guess there's curiosity, like when most babies get circumcised, at least in the United States, they're, they're very young. They're just after being born, right? Is it possible to experience trauma then? Like, does the nervous system even recognize that? And does it last beyond uh, those years? Like, I'm curious about that because a lot of guys will say, oh, I, I, I've been suffering my whole life because I was circumcised and I, I have this trauma from that. And I've wondered sometimes, is that trauma or is there, is there just grief around that? Is it important to differentiate? And then is that an excuse for shitty behavior too, because it was my trauma. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm curious what comes up for you. Sure. Anything can be an excuse for shitty behavior. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I worked with someone and I think you sent him your way um, because it was something I was curious about, or at least I called you to consult with you and I consulted with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He was like very, very, pissed off and hurt that when he was born, somebody cut off the tip of his dick. Yeah. You know, like what a fucking violation. Totally. You know, um, is it an aversive experience? Yes. Does it stay in the nervous system? I don't know. I imagine that it could, 
just mm-hmm. like anything else, you yeah. know, that we don't consciously remember, but our bodies remember things, you know, that's something that I've seen in so many different contexts as a former massage therapist, um, and as a clinical mental health counselor, I remember being in, <clears throat> being in massage school and, It was deep tissue massage specifically to change posture and to release memories stored in the tissue. And I watched someone in the training be worked on Mm -hmm. and then regress to infancy. Mm. It was so wild. He was like moving his head side to side and doing this. Wow. And one of the instructors said, he's trying to nurse. Mm. Like he's experiencing infancy that young. And so she like wet her finger and like rubbed it on his lips so that he could have that experience of being met by what he was reaching for. It was so powerful and so intimate. And he was uh, glowing, shining when he came out of it. And so I definitely believe that it could be lodged in our bodies, in our nervous systems, Um, and I think it's a fucking barbaric practice. Yeah. Welcome to the world, kid. Now we're going to cut off one of the most sensitive areas of your body. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus. What would you say to any guy who's listening to this, who was circumcised, who might have feelings about being circumcised Mm -hmm. against as well? Yeah. I mean, that I think your feelings are valid. I think there are activist groups where you can put that anger and hurt and frustration into trying to make a change in our society. Mm. But that it's probably best to do something, even if it's just to grieve and hit a pillow Mm -hmm. versus just bottle it up. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Because that's one of the biggest programming pieces of programming a lot of us who've been socialized as men get is keep it in bottle it up Mm -hmm. and that eventually just builds pressure and builds pressure and then bad things happen. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can say with some confidence experientially as a professional bottling it up doesn't tend to work out very well (laughs) long-term for anyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (sighs) That's Maybe we should end on that note. <laughs> That's a pretty <laughs> potent note to end on. Are yeah. there any other yeah. thoughts that you have or things that you want to fit into this or pieces that you would feel uh, bummed about not saying? I think on that note, you know, one of my favorite sayings that I use is what we resist persists. And that as difficult as it is, acceptance and being present with what is happening are incredibly healing, not approval, but acceptance Mm -hmm. that this is happening or did happen. And if I can embrace that and be with it and see what it needs and what I need, that's a huge part of healing. Yeah. After recording this interview, I realized there was a really important question that I forgot to ask, and I'm going to ask it right now and edit it into the end of this episode. Papillon, Let's say there's a guy listening to this podcast right now, and he has experienced some kind of unwanted or painful or potentially sexually traumatic experience in his past, and he's wondering what steps he can take today to help integrate this, to help heal this in his life right now. I'm wondering what sort of advice or resources you would give this man to help him move forward in his life in a good way today. Hey, Taylor. I'm really glad that you asked this as a follow-up question, and I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't think to talk about it during the interview. It's really important. So if you who are listening have had some type of unwanted or abusive sexual experience or even unsure about something kind of weird that happened, there are a number of resources I would direct you towards. One is a trained professional You can search for a therapist um, via sexual trauma or trauma on some different therapist finder websites uh, local to your area. You can also Google, um, they're generally called rape crisis centers. Now this doesn't mean they only serve folks who have been raped. Um, They serve folks who have had any type of unwanted or abusive sexual experience usually of any gender, though my experience has been that sometimes in smaller towns, 
They tend to only serve women, which is a little unfortunate and still represents some of the biases in our culture. Um, but if you Google the nearest city near you and rape crisis center, you'll probably be able to find something and call them and set up an appointment. Um, and therapists there do have uh, extensive training in how to hold space and work with sexual trauma, even for those who have some uncertainty. So that's one resource. Um, the next one I would recommend is a website, rainn.org. Um, rain.org that's again some harsh language it's the rape abuse and incest national network they've got tons of resources they can direct you to local centers um, they've got a helpline a chat line all kinds of things like that um, third resource specifically for male survivors is a really good book called victims no longer by mike lew l-e-w uh, really thick, really comprehensive, um, contains a lot of good information. It contains some survivor stories, so be prepared for that. And um, yeah, I guess I would just also say, you know, if something like this has happened to you, I'm really sorry that it's happened. And uh, I hope that you're able to take the risk to reach out and get some help. And these are three different reasonably safe areas or places for you to do so. So thanks again, Taylor, and uh, y'all take care of yourselves. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been super rich. I've enjoyed all the different directions we've gone. And I, yeah, I feel inspired and motivated and intrigued to do some research as well. And where can people find you if they want to either work with you? Are you you're accepting new people, new clients? Usually, yeah. Usually. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, they can find me at agencyofchange.net. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions. Please don't send me big stories of gruesome trauma, um, but I'm happy to offer advice or resources, books, websites, things like that, if I can be helpful. And yeah, I often have spots open for therapy for people who are in North Carolina. I also um, do coaching, not trauma coaching. That's too close to therapy. Yeah. Just for folks who are feeling stuck or trying to figure some shit out, move their life in a different way. Um, and that's not only limited to North Carolina. Got it. We'll put a link to your website in the show notes and your podcast in the show notes. Thank you so much again for being here. It's been an awesome conversation. And thank you everybody for listening. If you liked this episode, let me know. Shoot me a message either via Instagram or email. I would love to hear from you. And let me know if you have any requests for the future. I'll see you next time.